If you're heading into year one of your homeschool, what do you need to build your confidence as you move into this new homeschool life? If you are a homeschool mom who's been doing this homeschool thing for a while, what would you say to a year one homeschool parent to bolster their confidence? If you want to become a confident homeschool mom in year one, this podcast episode is for you. And if you want your confidence bolstered and you're not in year one, this discussion will still benefit you. Get ready for the nine steps to build or bolster your confidence as a homeschool mom from year one. Welcome to the Homeschool Mama Self-Care Podcast. I'm Teresa Wiedrich, the certified life coach, homeschool mentor, and graduated homeschool mom who walks beside other homeschool moms so they can become more confident, competent, happier homeschool moms. I support you to shed what's not working so you can show up authentically, confidently, and intentionally. So if that's you, welcome. As a graduated homeschool mom who walks alongside others to help them shed what's not working so they can stop pushing through and instead meet their needs, manage their stress, and set realistic expectations, I know that these nine steps to thrive and become a confident homeschool mom from year one will benefit you. When I first built or designed or researched a homestead, this three acre homestead in the Kootenai Mountains, I had never raised a chick. I had never processed a meat bird. I had never raised goats or cared for a fruit orchard. I'd never lived anywhere where cougars and bears were real neighbors, but actually trying to keep deer away from the shrubs was even more challenging than trying to get the great peer barking at the deer. I didn't know anything about any of these things. I assumed that with a lot of research, I could just do it. And I have, but I should have spent a whole lot more time researching the large guardian dog than I should have researched the baby chicks. So many things on a homestead when you grew up in the suburbs are new to you and you don't know where to start and you don't know what the best design is and you don't know the best way to save money or all the things that come with learning something new. This is also my experience as a new homeschool mom. The advice I would have given my year one homeschool parent self is a whole lot different than what I thought I needed to research and design. So on today's episode, I'm going to share with you the nine steps to thrive so you can build confidence in your homeschool mom life from year one. These are the most important things to build confidence in your homeschool life. Some homeschool moms I walk alongside are early in their homeschool journeys. Many of them are in preparation mode right now as they begin their first homeschool experience this upcoming year. So if that's you, welcome. If you haven't already signed up for the guide to your first homeschool year, 52 weeks of confidence, clarity, and an action plan for the first homeschool year, then head over to the show notes to this episode, The Nine Steps to Thrive, Confident Homeschool Mom in Year One, on my website, capturingthecharmedlife.com. Because there's nothing that will get you more confidence more quickly than having a seasoned guide walk alongside you to regularly infuse you with confidence and motivation in your first homeschool year. If you want to be a confident homeschool mom from year one, I'm going to actually pull back the curtain to a conversation, a series of conversations that I've had as I've coached Sarah. Who is Sarah, you ask? Sarah is the typical representation of a new homeschool mom. She is not an actual in real life homeschool mom, although I've been told by AI that Sarah is a very common homeschool mom name. If that's you, 
send me a message. I would like to just hear if this is true. So Sarah is the typical representation of a new homeschool mom who wanted to be a confident homeschool mom from year one. Maybe she was having a chat with Grace. Grace was not so confident. Listen to Grace's description of her first homeschool year. She said, I'm a mom of three, ages 13, 11, and six. My older two are in public school, but I homeschooled my youngest this past year because I didn't think he was ready for public school kindergarten. We will be moving in a year, at which point I will likely be homeschooling all three kids. The past year was a disaster. I definitely homeschooled out of fear and anxiety. I had a support teacher with an online homeschool, but she was not the right fit and didn't provide me the support I needed. I was trying my best to unschool, but felt lost without much of an experience with doing so. I felt overwhelmed with other commitments with part-time work and volunteering and homeschooling. Definitely had too much on my plate and lacked time to research into what I could be doing with my son. We tried things that the teacher recommended, but they were fails. I struggled even to help my son remember letters of the alphabet or numbers to 10. I realize now there probably lacked enough repetition in applying them in different activities, but it was honestly challenging when I couldn't homeschool full time. I didn't know how to set things up so he could do some learning on his own. I didn't know what to do when he just couldn't remember things. I also realized that my own learning style preference is class learning. I like to be just told what to do and do it. So this experience was overwhelming. I need someone to give me guidance to plan homeschooling, which is why I'm here. I had curriculum for only math and language arts. They were helpful, but depending on the day, a lesson that was supposed to take 15 to 30 minutes would get drawn out quite a bit when my son lost focus or got tired and needed a break. Other subjects, I was more at a loss to know what to do. Ideally, I would have non-intensive curriculum that covered all the basics, leaving time to reinforce learning through daily living. I would also appreciate help to know how to teach the unschooling way. When Sarah had a chat with Grace, she determined she wanted to feel confident going to her year one homeschool. A little bit about Sarah. When she first entertained the idea of homeschooling her two kids, she had a few concerns. She too wondered, could she manage their education alongside her part-time job? Would they find a place to make friends or miss out on some cool school field trips? As she scrolled through endless Facebook groups and Instagram accounts and Google searches, she stumbled upon a startling statistic, which by the way is real. The number of homeschooled students in the United States had surged from 850,000 in 1999 to over 3.1 million in 2022, representing roughly 6% of school-aged children. This statistic is according to the National Home Education Research Institute. You can find the details on the show notes to this episode. Encouraged by the rather large and quickly growing community and the success stories of other homeschool families, Sarah decided to take the plunge. Here's how she navigated the path to becoming a confident homeschool mom. Step one, equip yourself with knowledge. Sarah's question. Okay, what are the legal requirements for homeschooling and how do I prepare if someone comes knocking on my door? Classic question. You can find a specific discussion on your state or province on the show notes to this episode. Of course, you can also Google it, but I have tried to find legitimate sources that real homeschool moms would search for in their state or province. So that's Canada and US. And I apologize for any of those that are outside um, jurisdiction or this area. If you are outside this area and you do have a reference site please send it to me and I will include it on my page. I remember spending countless hours researching and exploring approaches and trying to pick and choose the very best curriculum options for my family. It wasn't until my third or fourth year though that I resolved to do my homeschool in a way that served each of my kids and also me. 
because I no longer wanted to feel like I was a chicken with its head cut off. <laughs> but it wasn't until around the six to eight year that I confidently determined I was going to homeschool in my unique way for my unique reasons. And I no longer cared what other people thought about that or how they were doing it differently in their homes. It wasn't until my six to eight year that I genuinely knew I could do this homeschool thing because I learned to navigate the typical uncertainties, handle the tough family moments, confidently answer the public FAQs, because I built a burnout prevention plan, which I didn't call it then, but it is essentially what I did, and I created a routine that supported individualized learning. And if you don't know already, I'm all about enabling you to become a confident homeschool mom from year one. I know that if you have a guide to walk alongside you, you can gain the confidence and the clarity a whole lot faster than I learned it. Eight years not required. However, if you intend to do it independently, one of the first steps to gaining confidence in homeschooling is to educate yourself about these things. Here's some of the things. Child development, relationships, how to communicate and how to listen to others, how people learn, what is an education anyway, researching homeschool methods, creating self-awareness practices for yourself, obviously, learning to address your big emotions and incorporating self-compassion strategies. Oh, and exploring curriculum options too. But let that be the last one on your list. Sarah began by researching her local regulations and connecting with local homeschool groups. She discovered that some areas had minimal requirements while others demanded detailed records and standardized testing too. Sarah learned the regulations and legislation where she lived and could discuss it with inquiring minds who want to know, because they will, this is step one to a confident homeschool mom, year one. Step two is to create a support network. Sarah's question, how can I provide opportunities for social interaction for my kids when I don't know anyone homeschooling? Where do I connect with other homeschool families and will they align with what I'm doing? Disconnect and loneliness can be a challenge for homeschool moms if they don't create time for outside relationships and if they only choose relationships within a fixed mindset. Here's a few lessons I've learned about building a support network. Your support network doesn't have to be homeschool families. It does not have to be your family of origin. It doesn't have to be people that homeschool like you or even people that have the same worldview. I believe homeschooling affords you the opportunity to think outside the box. And I think it can help you think outside the box, even in your support network. If travel has taught me anything, it is that most people value similar things. They show up for each other. They care about their families. They want to do right by people around them. And though we be different, we have a lot of commonalities and we can connect with each other if we set aside an assumption that people have to be the same as us. But it's also reassuring to know that 83% of homeschool families do participate in co-ops or support groups or forest schools or religious organizations that offer social opportunities for both kids and parents. By the way, that data comes from the Coalition for Responsible Home Education, also found on the show notes to this episode. So what did Sarah do? She joined a local co-op where she met other parents who shared resources, organized field trips, and encouraged each other in the bits of conversation they could have in the parking lot after their co-op. Then she invited a few of those moms for coffee once a month. One of those moms became her weekly coffee partner. And one family in that group became her trading kids partner. In other words, every week, she allowed her kids to go over to that friend's house. The next week, her friend's kids came to her house. Side note here. Remember what it was like when you were a new mom? 
Who did you hang out with then? Possibly that baby group where you sat in a circle and compared breastfeeding to bottle feeding, organic cotton sleepers to whatever the other stuff is that seemed more affordable, and whether you'd hand make your baby food or buy the jars of baby food, you became a new mom and you connected with a new circle. New people you'd never met before. You had no idea what their worldview was. You had no idea what they thought about various things because it was all new to them. <laughs> it was most definitely new to you. You just wanted to know you could do it alongside someone else that was doing the new thing with you. These moms might not be your best friends as you continue in your mom journey, but you got to start somewhere. Whether you find an in-person group or not, you're always welcome to join the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective. I offer a special time dedicated to the first-year homeschool parents, and you'll also be able to kibitz with homeschool moms who've homeschooled for a while in the Year 2 and Beyond group. This is a surefire way to build confidence into your Year 1. More than any other time of the homeschool journey, you'll want support. That's why I created the first year Confident Homeschool Mom Collective designed to support and empower new homeschool parents to help you move beyond your limiting beliefs, to navigate typical uncertainties of the first year, handle tough family dynamics, confidently answer the public's FAQs, build a burnout prevention plan, and create a routine that supports individualized learning. No question, when you find a resident mentor or guide, you're going to experience greater ease as you transition into this new lifestyle. I'll not only offer the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective a time to connect and discuss all these things, but I'm also going to offer you unique workshops just for the first years. I'll throw a few of the ideas at you, but just as the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective members know, I also offer workshops individualized to them because I believe individualized learning is also applicable to the, to the adult years. Here are a few workshops I'm offering this year. How to create a routine that works for you and your kids. How to motivate your kids and keep them from boredom. What to do about screen time, setting up a homeschool space, where to purchase curriculum, and how to decide what curriculum, creating a burnout prevention plan, avoiding overwhelm and stress, and enacting a practical plan to avoid them, determining which homeschool method suits your family, what to do about unsupportive family or friends, how to answer the yes question, are your kids socialized? Dealing with your doubts and creating a plan to address them. How or if you should record homeschool activities if they're not required to be recorded. Creating an end-of-year portfolio. How to assess your first homeschool year and determine how to transition to your second. You'll also be invited to our book discussions once a month, our writer's room to encourage a journaling or blogging practice if that's of interest to you. You'll have discounts on group coaching programs offered throughout the year. You'll get to connect with guests from the podcast in our extended guest interviews. Last month, we had Judy Arnell, author of Unschooling to University. And most importantly, you'll have an opportunity to connect with other year one homeschoolers. I'm confident you'll build confidence as you join the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective. Step three, develop a flexible routine. Sarah's question is, how can I establish routines that balance homeschooling with volunteer work, time for me, my part-time job, and exercise? Okay, a little straight talk. Balancing will be a challenge. I don't believe in balance. That's the straight honest truth. I don't think balance as a mom, whether you're homeschooling or otherwise, is really a thing. I believe presence is your goal. Wherever you are, be there. Mothering, homeschooling or otherwise, is a lot. Saturated, like a dry sponge just dropped into a pail of cooking oil. It's like that. 
And I'm really seeing it now, now that I am launching my kids. I've got three kids launched. Um, my fourth is going into his second year of high school. And um, I can see now I have a whole lot more time than I did before. Things are a lot less busy in my head. Because of the possible homeschool freedoms that you can embrace, you could create a lot of margin around your activities, which will help you feel more balanced. And that is what we're going after anyway, isn't it? The feeling of being balanced. Flexibility is one of the key advantages of homeschooling, but many don't take it. I know it was challenging for me. However, Sarah determined to establish a flexible but fairly consistent routine to help her children and herself thrive. She time audited and she time blocked. She blocked out her time from the moment she woke up to the moment she determined to go to bed. She paid attention to when the kids were no longer paying attention. And she didn't force feed an education because school is known to be finished at three o'clock. So dismissal should be three o'clock in a homeschool too, right? This approach not only kept her kids engaged more, but also allowed her to adapt when someone called to ask if she could pick up their child from school or when she had to make an emergency visit to check on an older relative or when there was a flood in the basement, because stuff like this, it happens when you're homeschooling. P.S. Sarah also joined me in the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective, where I offered a workshop designed to time audit and time block her life. Step four is to clarify your core family, homeschool, and educational values. Sarah's question. How do I find and choose a curriculum that fits my child's learning style and educational needs, but also isn't crazy expensive? Homeschooling isn't just about education. It's a lifestyle choice that should align with our core family values. If you clarify your values and create a vision statement, you'll create a compass to guide you, which will always redirect you to what matters most three things you can do in this step four to clarify your core family, homeschool, and educational values. One, ask yourself why. Why are you homeschooling? Get your journal, get your pen, answer the question right now, or if you're listening to this podcast and you happen to be outside gardening or sitting by the beach while the kids are playing in the water, you can grab your notes or your pages on your phone and answer. Why do you want to homeschool? By the way, you're going to be answering this question every year. It'll change. The list will probably get a lot longer, but every year you want to clarify why. So you know that the reasons you're doing it apply to this year and you'll have the motivation to continue. Question two, identify your family and educational values. You can do this with the family or without. You can gather your family together, have an open conversation about your core family values and the values you aspire to in your homeschool life. Also, you can do it separately. Discuss the aspects of an education, of a family life, of the relationships you've created within that family life that matter most to each of the family member. And then if you happen to be coming from a schooled environment, moving into homeschooling, also record what hasn't worked in school. Also, what did work in school? And what do you hope to see in your homeschool? And the third discussion point is to craft your homeschool vision statement. This is not something I would have done in my early days because I thought this was too much work. It doesn't have to be definitive. In fact, Every year of your parenting journey, it will shift. You won't see the world the same way that you once did. You won't see family life the same way either. But today, based on your reflections, based on your values, the things that you've already been writing down in your journal, create a homeschool vision statement. What's your long-term goal? If you could wave your magic wand 
and create a homeschool family life just as you've always wanted, write that down. What's your vision? And if you're especially conscientious, you could also include your preferred educational approach or method. You could record specific family dynamic goals, like the way you'd like to interact with each other. And you could definitely write your personal growth goals because they are also just as important. Then hang it up in the fridge and check back next year. When you've answered these questions about family values, educational values, and you've crafted your homeschool vision statement, then you can pursue a deep dive on curriculum. When you head over to the show notes to this episode, you'll find a variety of discussion points around curriculum and how to choose it. Curriculum does not have to be expensive. There are beautiful options out there that are expensive, and it's not to say that they aren't valuable. Of course, they could be valuable. But in my experience, all books, all resources, all games, all learning opportunities can be as useful as a crazy expensive curriculum. And a greater education does not occur because you have a more expensive curriculum. But one thing is true. At the end of your homeschool days, you will discover, as I have, you will not use all the curriculum. <laughs> you will still have a homeschool room filled with curriculum that you cannot sell and that is still perfectly usable and very interesting and you wish you could have used with the kids but didn't. After Sarah asked herself why she's homeschooling, what her family and educational values are, and she crafted her homeschool vision statement, it was then that she determined to get clear on what curriculum she would like to purchase for this year. Step five, build awareness practices to deal with your routine frustrations. Here's Sarah's question. How can I develop patience? Because that isn't my strong suit. I said many homeschool moms. For many years, I resisted personal growth, not because I was intentional about that, but because I wasn't equipped to do it. I invested much of my emotional energy being frustrated with how circumstances weren't as I wanted them to be and responded primarily out of fear, not responding to life circumstances with agency. When we don't like what's happening to us, this is what we tend to do. We worry thinking we'll anticipate all the possibilities, which of course rarely happen as we expect them to. Or we fuss with others as though conversations fussing with others will influence our scenario in some positive way. We get angry as though attempting to control will actually shift the trajectory of the scenario. We feel perpetually overwhelmed because we're trying to get all the things in the hamster wheel of our minds done. We feel like we're losing our minds because it's too much for us to hold in our mind. We get sick because the body keeps the score and internalizes that emotion, AKA energy in motion. And we therefore feel inevitably unhappy. For many years when parents would ask me or declare, uh, are you patient? Or I couldn't homeschool because I'm not patient enough. I would be thinking, um, is that a prerequisite? Because that's going to be a problem for me. I've learned that patience is really a combination of learning another person and listening to another person and really trying to understand someone else or understand a scenario. Patience is more about trying to understand. And when we try to understand, it means we're going slower. We're not allowing our immediate reactivity to control the day or control the scenario. I know that homeschool mom frustration resonates with many. Here's five quick thoughts to help you address frustration and overwhelm and move toward growth, which will inevitably enable you to be more patient. So five thoughts. You can't control people, not even your little people. You can't control yourself either. If you grow in understanding of yourself, 
you'll find more helpful ways to approach your moments of frustration. I'll say that again. You can't control yourself either. If you grow in understanding yourself, you'll find more helpful ways to approach your moments of frustration. Third thought, you can only do what you know to do now. In the words of Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Fourth thought, accept your and your kids' humanness. You aren't perfect. You're never going to be. You won't mother perfectly or homeschool perfectly, and your kids won't kid perfectly either. Plan for your moments or seasons of frustration and overwhelm. Accept your human reality. Frustration and overwhelm are part of this human journey. Well, now with those encouraging words <laughs> to become a confident homeschool mom in year one, you can ask yourself these five questions. So grab your journal, ask yourself these questions to create a plan for handling overwhelm and frustration. Question one, how do you typically handle your feelings of frustration and overwhelm? Your goal is to acknowledge emotions as signals. Recognize feelings of frustration and overwhelm. They're natural responses when stepping into anything new. Consider these emotions as signals to help you take a step back, reevaluate your approach or your reactivity and make the necessary adjustments. Question two. Are you breaking down your goals into manageable steps? Instead of trying to tackle your reactivity with one fell swoop, break down your tinier goals into smaller, more manageable steps. As I've shared many times with homeschool moms as I coach them toward addressing their big emotions, sometimes if you are in the habit of very fast, hot reactivity, your first step is to spin on your heels and walk away. Or if you have an opportunity in the moment to just pause, breathe deeply, know that you don't have to say the first thing that comes to your mind. You can slow it down. You do not even have to respond in the moment. Just put your hand on your heart. Tell yourself, I'm okay. Breathe in deeply. Exhale slower. And ask yourself, what is the next right step? That could be step one to your f big emotions, but there might be many other possible steps on your path. Maybe you have different experiences of overwhelm and frustration. The key is to break down your goals into smaller, manageable steps, which not coincidentally also makes this process less overwhelming. And we don't need to overwhelm you when you're trying to manage your overwhelm. <laughs> and also it helps you feel more focused and clear and you actually see progress. Question three, how often do you practice self-compassionate self-talk like morning affirmations, expressing gratitude, or reframing negative thoughts? We want to learn how to practice self-compassion, to treat ourselves with the same kindness and understanding that we'd offer to a friend if she were in the same scenario as us. Remember that growth comes from facing difficulties and learning from them. Question four, are you willing to let go of educational approaches or methods that aren't working for your child or for you? Even though on paper or on someone else's Instagram feed, they look amazing. If you're willing to let go or be flexible, it allows us to pivot. Remember that word from 2020? It allows us to pivot when we need to discover creative solutions that are going to serve our child's unique needs. And sometimes creating creative solutions means we're going to let go of something that somebody else is doing that doesn't work for us. And question five, in what ways do you celebrate your small wins? You need to celebrate regularly. And I'm delighted that every Friday, that's my goal is to celebrate with the homeschool parents in the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective. 
Instead of fixating on what might not be going perfectly, let's celebrate the small wins and the progress you and your kids are making. One of the greatest confidence builders we can give to ourselves and our children and each other in our communities is to celebrate with each other, even if they're small wins. So what did Sarah practically do? Uh, this. She regularly engaged in journaling. She spent kind time with herself in the morning to both think her thoughts, express gratitude for the things that were going right. She spent time affirming herself in front of the mirror. She built cheerleading connections and she created a plan to address her unique manifestation of frustration and overwhelm. And she continued to learn and grow along the way. This podcast pause is just for the first year homeschool parent feeling overwhelmed at all the things. I offer you the Confident Homeschool 101 group coaching program, a group coaching program to build your confidence, clarify your intentions, and create an action plan for your first year. If you're a first year homeschool parent, you're on the inevitable journey to overcome imposter syndrome. You've never been a homeschooler. You've never been an educator, or maybe you have, and if you are, welcome. There are many educators turned homeschoolers in your midst. You've never taken on a new role with so many expectations and demands before. Or have you? Actually, most of us have. As I've shared before, I remember my first days as an RN in the postpartum unit at Kingston General Hospital. I trained for four years in a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. I spent three of those years preceptored in various hospital nursing units in Northern Alberta, including a high-risk labor and delivery unit. I spent months studying for the nursing CNATS exam. I worked night shifts as a unit clerk in a labor and delivery unit for the duration of my nursing training. Yet I was scared silly entering that postpartum unit in the first few months of my new role as an RN. I had my note cards with all the pertinent training that I was to give new moms before they left our unit. And as a side note, I was not a mother yet. <laughs> How very amusing to offer training when I'd not done it myself. But I digress. I remember what it was like to walk onto that unit in navy blue scrubs, pediatric stethoscope wrapped around my neck, stopwatch, notebook, black pen in my pocket. I was excited, but hella nervous. What was I supposed to do? Uh, meet for seven o'clock report? Okay, but then what? I knew, of course, but I didn't. I wasn't confident. I wasn't clear. The only plan I had was to not tick off the charge nurse. I learned that I had to have clear plans, but still be flexible that they weren't going to happen. I learned that I'd gain confidence as I did it, but I did it better when I was mentored. And thank goodness KGH began a three-month beta mentorship to new grads just as I began my paid nursing position, because walking alongside a seasoned RN was the confidence I needed to do that nursing thing. Fast forward a couple decades, okay, almost three. <laughs> and now I'm here, post-homeschooling, having homeschooled my four kids, three have fully launched, and I'm offering you this, an IV infusion of confidence, clarity, and focus as you begin your homeschool journey. But I promise not to try a real IV on you. <laughs> I'm no longer certified. Also, we're gonna do this virtually. In the upcoming Confident Homeschool 101 group coaching program, I'm offering an infusion of confidence, clarity, and plan to address your real upcoming homeschool first-year challenges. So you can be certain that what you'll be doing is the right thing for your family. Confident Homeschool 101 is designed for homeschool parents who feel uncertain about their homeschool capabilities, want a mentor who has overcome similar struggles, feels like a fish out of water and needs support outside of social media, want to create wellness strategies for themselves before they get started. It's for you if you struggle with anger, stress, or overwhelm and want to create a burnout prevention plan. It's for you if you want to create strategies to connect with your kids as they begin their journey. 
is for you if you want to be connected in a homeschool community from day one, or that you want to let go of unrealistic expectations before you create your unrealistic expectations. It's for you if you don't want to be uncertain about which homeschool method or curriculum you should adopt, or if you need to determine an effective, purposeful homeschool routine. If you want guidance on motivating your kids and know what to do with boredom, or know how to navigate the inevitable relational challenges that are yours when everyone comes home. I know that the first year has its own unique challenges, but I believe you can be confident, you can be clear, and you can create a realistic plan. You will be supported, encouraged, and challenged to advocate for your unique homeschool family. I've learned a whole lot of things and I'd love to share them with you too, but one thing I know There is no one like you. So my goal is to guide you to become competent and trust your intuition to raise your kids to live meaningful lives. So final thoughts. This group coaching program is designed to help you homeschool the way that you want to homeschool. Because no perfect homeschool exists. Homeschooling has many challenges and you signed up for the charms, not just the challenges. So if you're ready for it and you want to learn more, send me an email at TeresaWiedrich at Outlook.com. In the words of veteran homeschool mom of three, Diane, she says, let's face it, homeschooling is hard and amazing. There is elation and devastation all in the course of an average day. Teresa comes alongside to help you navigate your relationship with homeschooling, not to fix you, but to sufficiently assist you in detaching your identity from the activity so that in fact, the activity is elevated to new heights. She helps you parent and educate gently, not only for your children, but for yourself. Amen, Diane. That's exactly my goal. Okay, so step one was equip yourself with knowledge. Step two, create a support network. Step three, develop a flexible routine. Step four, clarify your core family, homeschool, and educational values. Step five, build self-awareness practices to deal with your routine frustrations. And step six is lean in to child-inspired learning. If you want your homeschool activities to matter to your kids, To create a love of learning and enable a customized education, lean in to child-inspired learning. I know there are concepts you want to impart to your kids or explore with your kids, no question. But learning doesn't necessarily happen because you said something out loud or because the kids have to read through a passage, narrate a passage, do the math worksheet, complete the lab report, or watch the video. Or even because I'm excited to share something with them. There were some days I expected my kids to be like little computers that could receive a daily upload. I did this because it made me feel like their education could be created and measured. If I could do the work to research a topic, buy the book, plan the lesson, teach it once or twice, then reinforce it, the kids should learn, right? Alas, with many kids and over many years, I've learned that most learning doesn't happen that way. In my early homeschool years, I tried the classical approach, doing the readings, the lectures, the reviewing, expecting my kids to return their readings with narrations, aka homeschool mama testing. And I was utterly surprised and often frustrated that they couldn't regurgitate what I'd taught. Surely, if I had done the work and been creative and interesting, they would be able to regurgitate what I so eagerly wanted to share with them. No? Rather, I learned these things. Kids can discuss their readings, and if they do, they are much more likely to process and keep them stashed inside their brains. If they can narrate or tell me back something, I am much more likely to hear them regurgitate that fact later, but not always. If we discuss something more than once, more than twice, it's more likely to be locked in, at least temporarily locked in, But if they are interested in a subject, their little brains are fully frontal and present. There is no need to entice them to engage. 
Engagement happens naturally and easily and is so much more fun for me to encourage their learning and their experimentation. And obviously, this is so much more fun for them too. Oh, the depths they can go if they're given time to pursue their interests. I learned that child-inspired learning in your homeschool works. It works. So naturally, I learned to bend in this direction. Here are four ways that you can incorporate child-inspired learning in your first year. One, incorporate your kids' interests. Pay attention to what your child is naturally curious about. Is it British history? Zoology? Integrate those interests into other topics, like if you're writing, have them write stories and reports or even their own books on those favorite topics. If you're doing spelling, you could create a vocabulary list based on their interest and make learning fun with games like Bananagrams or Scrabble or online games like Wordle. And if your child is especially competitive, you might put on a timer. You could integrate their interest into reading, of course, utilizing the library, exploring books related to their interests. That's probably a super easy one. How about math? Apply math to real life scenarios related to their interest, such as maybe calculating distances or measuring ingredients or understanding percentages. If you're doing science, engage in hands-on activities, nature studies, science kits that align with those interests. Integrate their interests into your discussions on history or economics or any subject area whatsoever. But you could, for history, you could specifically use historical fiction, documentaries, and activities to make history come alive. The second step to incorporate child-inspired learning into the first year is to recognize their different learning styles. Some kids prefer structured workbooks, and others thrive on free-flowing Step three is to get to know your child, understand their personality, whether you're using MBTI or Enneagram, learning more about introversion and extroversion, how they prefer to organize their day. It helps you to understand how to engage an education with that specific child in front of you, because the child in front of you is the one you are educating. You are not educating a room full of kids in a random school classroom. By the way, when you join the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective, you can check out the Enneagram 101 workshop that I offer at Homeschool Moms. It also is super valuable for you to learn more about family dynamics and how each person interacts, getting to know your child in context to their relationships. And the fourth step is to think outside the box. In that first year or two, you're going to learn a lot of approaches outside the educational box. You'll learn to mix traditional educational stuff with really unconventional stuff. You'll begin to recognize the learning in Minecraft and Lego and slime making, or learning how you can incorporate things like YouTube videos and documentaries into your learning activities. You are going to learn about real life experiences qualifying as real life learning, whether it's the investigating nature or building projects like the goat barn that we incorporated into our homeschool days, or engaging in creative play and watching the kids build a big stage on the backyard um, tree house so that they could put on small plays of various Shakespeare plays. We did that too. Begin to practice thinking outside the box because learning happens all the time. So what did Sarah do? She adjusted her approach based on what worked for each child. She observed them. She incorporated their interests. She intentionally set aside Fun Friday to do that. And she noticed when her kids were curious and wanted to learn more, and she allowed them to explore. And she learned how to incorporate child-inspired learning into classical schooled subjects. Step seven is a special step that doesn't get a lot of discussion, but I think it is super valuable because it causes a lot of frustration in that first year. It is to plan for relational reordering. When everyone comes home to home educate, the relationship dynamics shift. Even when a grown kiddo leaves home, I've noticed the next child becomes the oldest child until that child leaves home and then the next one becomes the oldest child. When a child develops an illness, family dynamics change. If parents are having relational challenges, 
the family dynamics change. If one child returns to school but the others don't, family dynamics shift. When one child hits full steam adolescence, (laughs) family dynamics change. Interpersonal dynamics frequently change for various reasons. Curiously, this work begins with you leveling up relationships, requires you to sign up for the work of the interior, your interior, to do the work, as they say. It isn't about other people that need to show up for you first. It's you that needs to show up for you first. Inner work is required to build stronger relationships. So you need to show up for you and ask yourself, what do I need for me? What do I need to do? When you do show up for you, you'll know how to address new and changing family dynamics more fluidly. Who you invite into your world, your inner world really matters. It's you that most deeply influences how you experience relationships though, how satisfied you are in relationships and how likely you'll feel seen, heard and accepted. You learning to relate more healthily to yourself is the most important thing. If you want to pre-plan for the relational reordering, consider these thoughts. One, understand the importance of relationships. In this highly individualized world, we still all need comfort and empathy during tough times. Sharing life is more enjoyable with others. Feeling connected is one of those base essentials for happiness. Interacting with others helps us learn and grow, even though sometimes uncomfortably, but we still are learning and growing because we're in relationships. And focus on your inner work. Show up for yourself. I have a story of coming back to me and learning how to show up for myself. I've been giving monthly snippets of my story in the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective in the private audio that's offered there. Unquestionably, my understanding of my world shifted dramatically when I came to understand that I wasn't seeing, hearing, or honoring myself at all. And in one fell swoop, or in one key summer, everything I'd ever understood about myself, about others, including about the one that created me, everything shattered and changed and shifted. I had to look for the first time at who I am, what I value, why I'm here, how I haven't been showing up for myself at all. I've learned that when we focus on showing up for ourselves first, we begin to build a sense of self. And who that person is can then relate to others with deeper, greater integrity and alignment. Our self-awareness and our well-being are step one to building strong relationships. So question for you, are you showing up for yourself? Are you seeing, hearing, and understanding yourself? Taking time to understand your needs, your boundaries, your desires. If you're not quite sure, you can use the Build Your Boundaries journaling workbook to do that. If you want to pre-plan for that relational reordering in your first homeschool year, Work to build strong relationships outside your home too. Connect with other moms at co-ops or wherever. All your relationships intersect and impact one another. You'll want to clarify your boundaries. Recognize when someone oversteps. Build awareness and identify when others are overstepping your boundaries. You'll want to learn how to express your needs and preferences openly. Some of these discussions are with your kids, some of them are with your partner, some of them are with your mom or your dad or various other friends and people in in your support network. If you don't feel like you're able to express your needs and your preferences openly, ask yourself why. Get clear on what your boundaries are because it will deeply influence your capacity to be present in your homeschool days. If you're wondering how to incorporate practical steps toward building or bolstering boundaries in your relationships, head over to the show notes to this episode. What did Sarah do? She grabbed her Build Your Boundaries journaling workbook and answered two journal prompts each morning. When she got frustrated during the year, she joined us in our round table conversations in the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective. 
And she recognized before her year even started that there would be relational reordering throughout the year. Step eight to being a confident homeschool mom in year one is to tackle unrealistic expectations. Sarah's question was, how do I homeschool more than one child at different grade levels and and get their needs met? And how do I do that with an eight-month-old baby? I know I can be a bit unrealistic, but any chance you've got a formula? (laughs) In a nutshell, nope, no formula. The hope to make that scenario happen is a great expectation. That scenario will be met messily. I don't believe in grade level learning. The school system does. I don't. And I genuinely don't believe you need to. The scenario you presented right there, I think, is a real unrealistic expectation. And if you want to be a confident homeschool mom in year one, you want to be realistic. P.S. That statement right there is an unrealistic expectation. (laughs) Are you still following me? We're homeschool moms. We have lofty ambitions for our kids, for their educations, and for ourselves. So how to manage unrealistic expectations in our homeschool? Know that you can't do everything. Really, you can't. No one is doing it all anyways, except that you're a human being who can only handle so much, and that is perfectly okay. So how to practice being realistic? I'm going to return to the discussion on time auditing and time blocking. Track everything you do for a week, and you'll see there is not enough time for everything, for all the things. Prioritize what's most important and learn to let go of the rest. There's some other unrealistic expectations that are pretty common, though. Like, you know... Some days they feel hijacked and you kind of think, none of my days should be hijacked. I've got plans. We should do the thing. And then they get hijacked. Well, for whatever reasons that you feel like that day was hijacked, just know that you don't have any choice to turn back time. So you just want to accept it. Some days will feel hijacked. Everyone won't always get along. Some days kids bicker more plans get disrupted. Uh, Some days your homeschool will feel hijacked. What you can do is to learn to address your big emotions. Use tools like the journaling workbook I've created to help you manage your big emotions or have a plan for those challenging days because they will arise. What did Sarah do? She learned to lean into reality and try to harness her inner Teresa. In coaching, I have often heard people refer to me as their inner Teresa, which is really hilarious for me to hear. Yeah, try to harness your inner Teresa. Some days will feel hijacked. These days are important learning opportunities too. Over the year, Sarah learned she was more idealistic than she initially understood. But since she was reminded that this would be her first year discovery, She wasn't intimidated, and she grew in confidence that she was normal. Her kids were normal, and unrealistic expectations didn't have to take her down. And the ninth and final step to become a confident homeschool mom in year one is to adopt a growth mindset. If you want to make things easier, ask yourself, How do I overcome uncertainty and build confidence in my ability to educate my kids, especially when everyone around me is questioning me? As a homeschool mom, you're responsible for your kids' education and also their social and emotional development. That task can appear daunting as we all recognize the gravitas. And yet, when we discover that this mothering thing can't be engaged flawlessly, When we learn there is no such thing as mothering perfectly, because we aren't perfect or flawless, then we discover we have a giant responsibility on our hands that could feel plenty overwhelming, or it could feel freeing. And if we want to feel freer, we must do the internal work and choose to grow ourselves up. How can you incorporate personal growth practices in your first homeschool year? Well, you can learn about family systems theory. Um, there are a select number of things that I would highly recommend you research. And not coincidentally, they're not directly homeschool related. And one of them is this, learning about family systems theory. It's by, the concept is by Murray Bowen, 
There are eight core concepts to this family systems theory, and they really just help you understand the dynamics of your family. You've heard a couple of them. They're in pop culture. So you've heard about sibling position and how that influences family dynamics, or you've heard about triangulating, or maybe you've heard about self-differentiation. There's a few different discussion points that you can check the show notes. If this is totally new to you, then check the show notes to this episode, Nine Steps to Thrive, Confident Homeschool Mom in One Year. And you'll also notice that I have an entire podcast episode dedicated to this discussion. Another way to incorporate personal growth practices is to build a practical plan to develop emotional self-regulation. Pay attention to your emotions. Notice the stories you're telling yourself your internal narrative, and how it impacts your day. Connect with others who understand and support your emotional journey. And if you don't have someone, book a no-obligation conversation to have a discussion with me. You might want to have me join you in your journey. Avoid self-shaming and encourage self-compassion. Honestly, I think these are powerful motivators towards a healthier mental space, but they're really challenging to do them without a construct of accountability, whether that is using a journal or using a friend or using a coach or a therapist to actually get into the narratives, the those self, you know, destructive narratives that we tell ourselves and learn what they actually are. And we can really uncover some of that when we go deep with someone else. If you want to incorporate personal growth practices, learn to build boundaries and healthier communication. You'll have many opportunities and you'll want to nurture the parent-child relationship. And though this one seems really obvious, uh, that's what we're doing, right? As homeschool parents. But I know what a lot of other moms know when they're in this homeschool space, we tend to doing a lot of stuff, but then not necessarily connecting with the kids. We need to be intentional about spending eyeball to eyeball time with our kids. This is what I call it. Eyeball to eyeball. Like when they're talking, I'm listening. Also acknowledging their feelings when they arise, whether they're really angry or disappointed or frustrated or whatever the feelings are. And I know that one was really, really tricky for me. Um, it didn't take very much for me to assume some internal narrative that wasn't true about the experience that my child was having in their big emotions. And over the course of time, I have learned a lot about myself and how I can listen to other people, even when they are having their big emotions. Nurturing the parent-child relationship, the most important element, an incredible way to build in personal growth. Even if you begin to incorporate just one of these personal growth practices in your first homeschool year, you will fast track your sense of ease in your homeschool mom life. Oh, and you'll be actively creating your burnout prevention plan without even thinking as you do so. In her first homeschool year, Sarah learned to become a confident homeschool mom by following nine practical steps She equipped herself with knowledge about homeschool legislation. She built a support network. She developed a flexible routine that balanced homeschooling with personal time. She clarified her family's core values and created a vision statement. She practiced self-awareness to manage her frustration and overwhelm. She leaned in to child-inspired learning. She planned for changing family dynamics. She set realistic expectations and she adopted a growth mindset. Becoming a confident homeschool mom is a journey that involves a willingness to continuously learn, instill growth practices and incorporate an authentic supportive community. And through all these nine steps, Sarah became a more competent, confident homeschool mom. And I believe you can too. It was a pleasure spending time with you. If this podcast was an encouragement for you, would you share it with another homeschool friend who you know would benefit too? And would you consider sharing a review on Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to this podcast? And when you share a review, screenshot your review, send it to me, and I'll offer you free access to the upcoming Homeschool Mom Room. 
In researching for this episode, I asked on socials, what is most likely to get in the way of your confidence as a first year homeschool mom? One mom shared with me, I have to tell you, it's the negative comments from family members comparing my kids to other kids her age and what they're able to do or not to. Those would probably be the biggest ones that derail my confidence. Yeah, that is, uh, I remember those days. Coincidentally, it is why I offer boundary building coaching. I've learned that this homeschool life can enable us to clarify why we're doing what we're doing and that bolsters our sense of self. We get really clear on why we're doing what we're doing, which bolsters our confidence. Another mom shared with me, this is her observation, that many parents struggle in homeschooling and often give up because they start with ideals rather than with the kids right in front of them. Sure, XYZ math program may be the best researched program, but that means nothing if it isn't well suited to your child and your lifestyle. So true. Thank you for that, Liana. I say this all the time. You want to homeschool the child in front of you because you're homeschooling a child, not a method. And it was a delight to hear from Amy Otto. She is the host of the Homeschool Compass podcast. She shared that I'm on her regular homeschool reread rotation, along with Susan Weisbauer, Cindy Rollins, Julie Bogart, and Sarah McKenzie. I am honored. I am honored to hear that. She was specifically asking me about the coffee chat for the first year homeschool mom section. And I am reminded to let you know that I have specifically written to you in my book, Homeschool Mama Self-Care, Nurturing the Nurturer. I hope you find it encouraging too. Remember, you can access the guide to your first homeschool year. It's free. It's available if you head over to my website, capturingthecharmedlife.com. Or if you'd like to join us for a week in the Confident Homeschool Mom Collective, you can find that at www.patreon.com slash homeschool mama self care. And if you'd like to learn more about the Confident Homeschool Mom 101 group coaching program, book a conversation with me. You can find my booking link on the first page of my website. All the show notes and resources discussed in this episode are found at www.capturingthecharmedlife.com. And if you're not hearing this from anyone else, and you're a first year homeschool mom, I want you to know that you can do this. It might seem daunting. It might seem a lot, but there have been many that have gone before you, including me. You've got this, girlfriend. <laughs>